everyone doing? Hey, good. <laughs> Response. <laughs> Let's rise and we pray and worship together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another day to come and worship you, Lord. Uh, thank you for everyone here. Uh, we've been worshiping in all our own throughout the week. And thank you for today that we're coming as one, worshiping one God. So, Father, uh, be the center of everything that we do this morning. And we praise you, lift up your great name. In the public name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. Amen. Friends together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could care? Till I met you, I was breathing by now, the light. All my failures I strive to hide. It was my tune till I met you. Called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glory.
them down. You broke them down. There was strength around us. By your grace, we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Here's the song awakened. All creation singing here alive. Cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found, that can hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. And what a love we found, that can hold us down. Awakens me, your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me, your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens.
without doubt it will remind me I'm wonderfully made You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay I know nothing has been wasted No failure or mistake You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay Without doubt it will remind me I'm wonderfully made You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay I know nothing has been wasted No failure or mistake You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay We make all things work together For my future Pastor, um, here when we go to construction site, there are signs that are different per state, but you see, we see like a give me a break sign there, a lot of different signs. But in Korea, that's kind of standardized. What they do put it is that under construction, sorry for the inconvenience. That's how it's written. And then we made a stickers of that, put everyone's here in the name on it. So we are still under construction, sorry for inconvenience. And in a way, you know, as a youth, that was it. But in realize as we grow too, you know, we are not done yet. We're not find a product. We won't be glorified body until we go to heaven. So, sorry for the inconvenience. I'm still under construction. <laughs> so let's do this one more time. Um, everyone has their own baggage. We all do. <laughs> we try to hide it, and then when we go to heaven, we get, we would we won't be checking those in. But. Um, even in those, when we're going through, it looks like you know no one else go through anything like this, and no one should go through anything like this. But in the final product, once you go through, then realize that those things made me where I am, who I am right now, where I'm standing. So even that, that I think my failure is not failure in his eyes. How lovely that is! That you know what I feel shameful. God goes, no, I'm ready for it. <laughs> There's no mistake. So the lyric we bridge over one more time as we do. Yeah, remember we are still under construction. <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience. <laughs> Don't expect perfection from us. Lord. <laughs> and I'm glad that God doesn't get perfection from us. When I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter, a canvas and Nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and sing again. When I'm done in low, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. I know nothing has been wasted. No failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished. 
finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. When I doubt it, Lord, remind me how wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. Hallelujah. I got a friend. Closer than a brother There is no judgment Oh, how he loves me I've got a friend And he is my strength He is my portion With me in the valley With me in the fire With me
Yes, Lord. <laughs> we praise you. We praise you, Lord. We come in your presence, Father, and in your loving arm as unfinished products. And, Lord, uh, it is, I know it's dangerous prayer. Lord, mold us the way you want it. But, Lord, we still come in your presence this morning as a church. We pray that, Lord, uh, show your presence in, in us this morning through your word and worship. We love you. We praise you, Father. Uh, thank you. Um, it's, it is great to be in your hand and knowing who you are. So, Father, we love you. We praise you in any such situation, any circumstances. Uh, in the power of the name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. 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 And how is everyone doing this morning? As my brother always uh, says, we woke up this morning, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, youth, you are dismissed as you guys are already leaving. Bye. <laughs> um, oh, I don't know why I'm like choked up right now. I think it's just a song. I mean, I remember in my past life, I felt so alone. And just to know that God is still working and he's not done with me yet is like, isn't that amazing? Like, just to know that. It's, it's, I don't know, for me, it's like, what, God, you have more, right? But, uh, all right, I can go on and on about that all day. So, uh, welcome our first-time visitors. Is this, if this is your first time, we do have a gift for you outside in the front. Uh, you do have to fill out your Connect card for us to, you know, get in contact with you if you need prayers or anything like that. If you're a first-time uh, guest with us online, you can find the Connect card on our app or at livinggracelv.org. Got it right today. <laughs> um, and next week, next week we are going to have a meeting for our Living Grace members. If you've taken the class and you are a member of Living Grace, we will have a meeting right after service. Uh, it's about 15 minutes long. Uh, we have to vote in a new member or, yeah, vote a new, huh? Council. council. We have to vote in a new council and go over our building fund, let you guys know where we're at, you know, just an update. And then uh, now it's time for our biggest fundraiser. Come on. Fourth of July fireworks fundraiser. Come on, Living Grace. That is one of the biggest fundraisers that we held every year for our ministries, for our women ministry, youth ministry, men's ministry. Come on, man. It's for our building fund. So if you guys have three hours out of your day to just um, – come and help and serve as pastor rich uh richard always says like we fellowship we get i mean some amazing things happen out there so if you if you can just come sign up on the app do not just text because <laughs> pastor richard cannot fill you in just apply on the app it's three hours if you can just do it one day that's enough um so we're looking for people for that and then the youth video please spiritually connect with God, friends, and family. You can also connect with counselors and have fun experiencing what God did for us. I think that you should go to Christ with presence. It is a very life-changing experience. It actually can help someone. Relationship with God seriously and pursue 
Amen to that. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback just for a second off of what uh, Margarita shared with you guys about our fireworks booth. Because I've had about, I don't know, 30 people come up to me and say, Pastor Richard, I'm here to help. Just fill me in wherever, it's, wherever you need me. That don't work. Yeah, I, I can't individually text 30 different people saying, hey, yeah, I need somebody at 3 o'clock day after tomorrow. I, it doesn't work. Um, so please, 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 I really beg of you to please go on and sign up. Um, Megan Wright, uh, it's, it's uh, pretty sparse right now. And we start fireworks. We pick them up tomorrow, and we start selling on Friday. So we're out of time. Um, so I really need everybody to go on and, and do some sign-ups. Jesse's got some, there are some manual sign-ups out there, so you guys can sign up on, on there as well. But um, so we, we have the opportunity <clears throat> to make a massive amount of money. I've told people before, there is nothing that I can do legally to make that kind of money in one week, Okay. And so we, we, we make a decent amount of money for our building fund, for missions, for all of the ministries of the church, but we can't do it by ourselves. Um, but more so, we always talk about what the why of why we do things. Yes, the, the money is fantastic, it's great, but we have an opportunity to do mission. Um, I can't tell you the number of people that we have led into uh, different drug rehab programs, different uh, areas to to help with the conditions that people are in out on the street. And we have an opportunity to minister to them the love of Jesus in a fireworks booth. Um, it, it's, it's the craziest thing when you start to see the ministry that actually happens, unless you're a, a, a secular organization, that that's not important to you, but it's important to us of how can we minister to the person that is standing before us, getting ready to spend their money on fireworks. We'll take the money too, but it's more, it's, it's really about that ministry. So please, please, please sign up. It is a massive mission field. So as we talk about mission, how you like, that's a good transition from mission, uh, from fireworks to mission. Uh, Josie, come up here because she tried to escape. She says, can I leave? I said, no, no, you cannot. So uh, even though she sings up here, she hates to be up here, I think. <laughs> no, no, she's okay. Um, so I wanted to introduce you because, and Josie's a representative of our team that's going to Panama. Um, her, her dad um, are, are going from here. Ugo is from the UK. It's truly an international team uh, that will be going and ministering. And today is really the last Sunday from a mission standpoint that I get to talk to you before we leave because we leave in 28 days. Um, we'll be uh, after fireworks. We are packing and we're out of here. Um, we're going to the island of San Miguel. I don't know anything else about that except for that it's uh, in Bocas de Toro is the, is the province of Panama. It's an island in the mountains. Um, but we get to go, uh, I, I was talking to John earlier, and um, I've done many missions into cities and different places, but as you guys have heard me talk about before, I'm the ends of the earth guy. I go where nobody goes. Um, when when a, when a national leader says, hey, I need somebody to go, and nobody's ever been there, I'm like, sign me up. Uh, I'll, I'll take it. We'll, we'll go. And I speak on behalf of my team that they'll go. But I want you guys to be praying for some names. Um, obviously, Josie and Jose, myself, uh, Dr. Ugo. I want you to pray for Amanda, Gregorio, uh, Daniel, uh, Marisol, Umberto. Um, they're all part of our team. By the time we get there, there'll be 20 of us uh, on this team. Christina, our other doctor that is going to be meeting us, us, um, it will be, it's truly an international team that will be going and reaching the indigenous people of Panama. Uh, I'm not sure if these are Imbara or, or Chiriqui or which Indian tribe it is, but we will be going to places where um, the, the 1,100 to 2,000 people that we will see through our clinic um, have never seen a doctor before. Have never seen, come here, Jose. <laughs> see, he's... The rest of the team got here. The rest of our U.S. Living Grace team uh, got here. But, um, guys, this is a, is a huge ministry opportunity because we get to go and, and help people with some of the things that ail them. But we are not capable of healing anybody of anything. 
in the amount of time that we're going to be there. What we are there for more so is to sh show people and introduce people to the Jesus that can heal everything that ails them, that, that can take care of all of those things. So we're going to do a missions offering as we do at once a month, and I want to just give you a little bit of logistics. So normally I would have a, a team of, I don't know, 10 or 12 people to amortize the $2,700 in medicine that I just spent. Uh, sorry. Um, I'd be, have that to amortize it over, but with three of us uh, to pay for food, transportation, medicine, everything else, the numbers don't work. So I'm outside raising money, trying to raise money outside of the church because we ask a lot of the church in, in ra fundraising. Um, if they can help. So today, this is what the, our missions offering is going to do. It's going to be going to help fund the mission, the $2,700 that I just spent on medicine, uh, that will help the people that are there. And glasses. So our optometrist is, will be back in the house this year again. Um, he, was, he was optometrist extraordinaire last year. And so, um, but uh, we, we ask you to pray for us. Um, because honestly, the last 30 days before we're ready to leave is when the enemy will attack. And I've told these guys, so recognize it for what it is. When, when the enemy attacks, I already told you it's going to happen. So just be ready for it. Make like a duck. Let it roll off your back, and, and, and we'll be fine. Because God is bigger than any, anything else that can, we're going to encounter. So be praying for us and the other names that, uh, that we threw out. Jesse and his team is going to go ahead and start passing the offering. And uh, we thank you for uh, sending us, for sending us uh, as, as your representatives. Um, but it doesn't get you guys off the hook. Um, at some point in time, you all are going to be standing right up here with us, um, ready to go. So... Pastor Richie, we'll uh, come up here and we'll pray for you as you uh, minister the word of God here in Las Vegas to us. <laughs> yeah, and I want to thank I want to thank Pastor Richard for taking us to the uh, highways and the byways and the mountains and the jungles and um, all kinds of really fun places and uh, uh, for the extra long hammocks as well. Yeah, hammocks. thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a blessing, guys. It really is um, and to uh, to be a part of of a uh, um, uh, of a team of people that that go and um, and really, I think as he was speaking, there are some here that are thinking, "Man, I should do that." You probably you should. should. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell him that because then that means you're going. <laughs> Josie said, "Don't do that." <laughs> Josie said to, to me, uh, I'll, "I'll go if you can find me the money." I had the money the next day. Yeah, so. yeah. That's how that goes. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. That's easy. <laughs> oh, so. Lord, thank you for today. God, I thank you for Pastor Richie and as he uh, brings the word of God to us today. God, I thank you for the passion and, and all that he, he delivers this word. God, I pray that this, uh, the word that he has today would be one that would inspire us but would also challenge us. Um, that, God, we would take these words that he is speaking and we go out and take them to the streets uh, where the people are at that need to hear these messages so loud and clear. So, God, we thank you uh, for being in a sending church, a church that sends us to the world to proclaim your gospel. And, God, uh, fill us up now so that we can go and pour out in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. All right, super cool. <clears throat> I have an old magazine that I got. Um, it's uh, dated uh, January the 18th, 1999. Uh, that's the cover of Time magazine. Uh, the crazy looking person in the middle has the sandwich board on that says, The End of the World, Y2K Insanity, Apocalypse Now, Will Computers Melt Down, Will Society, A Guide to Millennium Madness, and you too can have this for $2.95. That tells you how old this is. <laughs> um, I think that many of you might remember, some of you are too young to remember the Millennial Madness when um, uh, all sorts of reports were coming back that uh, our computers, national computers, international computers, infrastructure, everything was just going to die because of 
uh, the switch from 1999 to 2000. And there were people who were writing books about it. People were selling videos. People were making even believers in Jesus Christ were making good, good amounts of money on selling stuff and encouraging people to buy their book. And this is the biblical guideline to the Y2K madness and on and on and on. I had the privilege of hearing Pastor John Michaels speak on this subject. For those of you who don't know, uh, Calvary Chapel, uh, La, uh, uh, Spring Valley, uh, years ago, um, passed away, went to go be with Jesus. Uh, big missions heart too, by the way. Anyway, Pastor John, um, at one time in his career, uh, had a very, very high security clearance with Nevada Test Site, and um, um, uh, so uh, and was a computer programmer among other things. And I remember him saying, basically, please stop it. He said, I remember him saying this. I'm telling you this. I programmed those computers. Nothing is going to happen. Don't get all excited. Don't buy all the hype and all the merch. You don't need to do that because I'm telling you nothing is going to happen. Because it turns out the computer programmer was right. <laughs> and you know what it made me think about? Is that the ultimate programmer, if I would, God, he is the one who is in charge of all things. And he is saying everything is going to be okay. Can you say amen to that? We've been in this study called Understanding the Times, and um, I want to continue on in this. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, if, we, if, we, if our timing is right, uh, we'll be done with this series right when Jesus comes. Won't that be great? You know, the rapture, you know, and then all of our notes will be scattered all over the place. People can come in and pick up our Bibles and listen to what we said. Um, anyway, um, so I want to continue in this. And um, in uh, the, the Great Tribulation is the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 24 about that timing. In verse 20, he said, Pray that your flight, and these are those who will be fleeing out of Jerusalem, may not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will uh, be cut short. And so clearly, Jesus is talking about a time that has not happened yet. That is yet to come. And so as I was preparing for this time with, together this morning, I, 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 my, my intentions... Uh, began in um, Revelation chapter 6. So if you turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6, uh, verse 1, uh, it says this. It says, now, everybody say now. now. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud uh, voice uh, like thunder, come. And I went, because this is, this is our text for the week, and I go, Whoa, now, well, let's back it up to chapter 5. So it says in chapter 5, verse 1, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Everybody say, then. And I went, whoa, wait, no, let's back it up one more chapter. So our, our text today is Revelation chapter 4. <laughs> Because I find that when I'm in, in just, just meditating and sitting before the Lord, I find that I have to keep going back. And if this keeps up, we'll end in Genesis chapter 3. <laughs> uh, you don't think that's funny? I think it's hilarious. You do. Thank you, sis. No, it's, but, but sometimes you have to go backwards so you can move forward. Here's why I, I don't necessarily like to just dive into the middle of a scripture without context. It's important that we know the why. Why is now there? Why is then there? Why does it say what it says? And by the way, how, does, how did we get here? When chapter 4, verse 1 says, after this, I looked and behold. After what? Okay. After the letters that were written to the angels of the seven churches, if you've heard about the seven churches and the letters to those churches in the book of Revelation. 
after that, John the Apostle, who has got a backstage pass, if you would, he's invited up to HQ headquarters and he has the remarkable privilege to stand in the throne room of God and see things that are unbelievable to see and describe things to you and I that using the Greek language is the best he can describe them, although he is being led by the Holy Spirit. And so when we read this text, there are some who might say, man, Revelation, man, that's all allegorical. It doesn't, you can't, you can't define any meaning to anything. Okay, that's not exact. I, I would push back on that and differ in that there's a lot in this that we don't know, but there's a lot that we do know. And so we take what we do know based on what other scriptures say about the same thing, and we have some understanding. We'll get to the wrath of God poured out on the earth in chapter 6. We'll get to that, Lord willing. But before we get to the wrath of God, we need to talk about what's going on in heaven. We need to talk about what, what, what God has positioned John to see and to experience. Because even though the world is, 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 is in absolute chaos, heaven is calm, cool, in control. God is, as we'll see, seated on the throne. There is nothing that has caught him by surprise. Can you say amen to that? We, we love that. All right, we're in Revelation chapter 4, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the whole chapter, and then we're going to break it up, all right? So, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, reading out of the English Standard Version. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Oh, let's keep reading. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian and, spoke, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the Living creature <laughs> answered the phone. <laughs> oh, I couldn't help myself. No. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who was seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Woo-wee. Here we go. I hope you did not have a high-carbohydrate, high-sugar breakfast this morning. Uh-oh. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, after this, after the letters to the seven churches, John writes, 
I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, an open door. And just because you see a door open doesn't mean you just automatically run through it. Oh, boy, it's an open door. Yeah, but did God open that door? Many young people were engaged to someone that they thought was an open door, only to find out it was a closed door. That God didn't open it, they did. And all the singles said, hmm, hmm grumble. It's an o- a door open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me, like a trumpet, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Okay, 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 okay. Oh, Whew, this is powerful. I mean, I think it is. I'm not trying to convince you that it is. I'm just, I'm speaking out loud. Here we go. It's a door standing open in heaven. Let's talk about doors. Jesus said he was the door. That he says in John chapter 10, verse 7, I am the door. Jesus points to the exclusive nature of salvation. You know, um, it, 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 one of the things that makes Christianity difficult for some people to understand is the exclusivity of Christ. Because when Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, he wasn't saying that he was a way, one of many ways to God, uh, that he was a truth because there are all kinds of truth out there. We call that an ecumenical council whenever a bunch of religious leaders get together to try to focus on love and let's not talk about our differences and how we are diametrically opposed to one another and that we cannot all be true because it's more logical to believe that all truths are false than to say that they're all true. Let's just all get along. I say no. I am not interested in being a part of that, especially if you want me to come to bring the Christian version so that it looks like we all stand together doctrinally when we don't. And I have said no to certain, even this city, and I'm a unity guy, and I want to be able to be in some venues, but there are things that I've been asked to go to where I've said I can't go to that. And I'm not judging anyone else. I'm just saying I know you're going to present a sanitized version of your belief system which goes diametrically opposed to what the Bible says. And I'm not going to be the Christian representative in that. Jesus is exclusive. And that's hard for people. But yet, as the great C.S. Lewis said, that Jesus, when he made that statement, is either liar or he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. Because only a lunatic would make those kinds of claims. Jesus says that he was the way, the truth, the life. And he is our shepherd who leads us to the sheepfold through the door. And not only does he lead us and guide us, he is the door. And here he sees an open door, uh, uh, John does. And I think God brings open doors to us all the time. It's important that we recognize open doors that God has sent us. What's an open door? It is an opportunity to be a light, to share the gospel, to to, uh, to, uh, uh, preach the good news of the gospel. Uh, How many times have you been in a situation where somehow or another the conversation just seems to steer itself towards spiritual things? It's a little bit easier for me, not because I'm so good at it, but because eventually someone's going to ask what I do for a living. (laughs) Hey, what do you do for a living? I work in a church. Oh, really? Yeah, how about you? And that just opens up the door, right? But it's important that we make the most of those opportunities that God sends our way. So there's an open door to heaven. And John hears a voice, and it's a voice that he has heard earlier in Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 1. It's the voice of the Lord Jesus. And it says, come up here. And behold, a voice set, a, a throne was set in heaven, and one seated on the throne. Now, I just want us to meditate on this for just a moment. 
Like, we all know that, right? We all know there's a throne in heaven. And we all know Jesus is seated, God is seated, Jesus is seated on, on the, we all know that. Think about the implications of that. There's a throne in heaven. And I believe it's the center of all things seen and unseen, my, my personal opinion. I believe it's the center of everything. And, and there is one seated on the throne. When I was in youth ministry, I used to use this analogy um, where uh, we would talk about who, who is sitting on the throne of your heart. Like, like, because it's either you, and many of you here know what that's like, because you weren't born into the kingdom of God when you were born out of the womb. Some of y'all had to go the long way around. <laughs> but don't matter how long it takes you, as long as you get on the bus by God's grace. And we used to say, who's seated on the throne of your life? Because oh, there can only be two, two entities, people. There's, it's either you or it's God. But you cannot be seated on the throne of your life and God too. Like Kind of like, okay, Lord, you get this much. That's it. Okay? You get half. Because you know what that means. That means you're seated on the throne of your life. My decisions, my life, my way. I consult God when I need to. And I do things and I ask God to bless it. That, that's not him seated. Now, now, by God's grace, I know that everyone would say, and I want him seated on the throne of my heart. But that's not always how it is. That's where repentance comes in. That's where grace comes in. That's where sanctification happens, where there's much less of us sitting on the throne of our heart and much more of him sitting on the throne of our heart, right? We could all agree to that. That's a, that work in process. The throne gets John's attention. There's a, it's the centerpiece for those who might believe there is no God or believe that there's nothing beyond what we can see, as I once heard someone say, if it can't be reduced to a mathematical equation, it can't be real. And I've often wondered how you would calculate love. <laughs> um, the, the atheist or the materialist would say there is no throne. There is no throne. And for sure, there's no one sitting on that throne because there is no throne. And if there was a throne, then mankind would be sitting on. Mankind is, is in charge of his own destiny. Man is left to himself, but he's got to figure this thing out to which we ask, yeah, how are we doing? Ah, not too good. It turns out we need someone else seated, seated on the throne not on earth, but in heaven to help us to know, I don't know, right and wrong, absolute truth to determine what love really is and what, what it really looks like or else we kind of make it out on our own and it ends up being the one who has the most power who tells you what truth is. Humanists would say, yeah, man sits on the throne because if we dethrone God, then it's left to who knows what, maybe a political leader or religious leader or ourselves to sit on that throne. Oh, but there's a, there's a throne in heaven, and there's one seated on the throne. He's not standing. He is seated. Okay, I get that, right? That, that speaks to, I don't know, it speaks to, he's not rushed or pressed. or He's seated on, that's what kings do. Kings sit on the throne, and this is the ultimate throne. And that's, that's what John sees, and it's a powerful declaration of a lot of things. One uh, is the presence of God, like God does exist. He has a throne, and he's seated on that throne, and his presence also is among us as well. Let's read this together in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. In the Amplified Bible, it says, therefore, read it with me, therefore, let us with privilege approach grace, that is the throne of God's gracious favor with confidence, without fear, so that we may receive mercy for our failures and find his amazing grace to help in time of need, an appropriate blessing coming the right, the right moment. We fragile 
creation can enter into the place of closeness to God, we won't see all those things that John sees, but there's a God seated on the throne and we can with confidence boldly run into that, that throne of grace and receive something, grace and mercy in the time of need. So because of what Jesus has done for us, we can come boldly with confidence to the throne of grace. It's not a throne of judgment. Rather, that we, it's that we have received forgiveness and mercy and righteousness in his grace. It's a powerful declaration of God's presence and a powerful declaration of God's sovereignty. He rightfully reigns over all. Now, we know this, but, but John gets a backstage picture of, 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 of God Almighty seated on the throne, and he reigns over all. And, you know, that, that helps me when things are crazy on earth to know God is, and we say it, well, you know, God's still seated on the throne. Yes, he is. No, really. And we believe that. And we believe that he's in control and he's in charge of everything. And therefore, we can have some confidence in faith that by his power, he works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Doesn't mean all things are good, but he works everything together. So what shapes your worldview? Because depending on who is sitting on that throne will determine what you believe about origins, what you believe about life, what you believe about death, what you believe about absolute truth, what you believe about how everything, cosmology, how everything got here, the stars, or what you believe about the afterlife. Everything will be determined based on who you have sitting on the throne of your heart. Morgan says this, while there may be differing interpretations, the fundamental truths are self-evident. At the center of everything is an occupied throne. There's a throne in heaven and God is seated on the throne. Verse three says, and he who sat there had, okay, are you ready for the description of God? What does God look like? How can we, can we, here we go. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the presence of an emerald. Well, what does God look like? How can we define or describe, does it, what's his shape? What's his makeup? John says he, he had the appearance. All I saw, I, I couldn't tell you exactly. Further questions would be futile, your honor. He, 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 it looked like Jasper and, and a carnelian stone. Write this cross-reference down, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26 and verse 28. John's vision is reminiscent of what the prophet Ezekiel saw when he said, in chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, that he saw something that looked like a throne made of blue lapis lazuli. And on his throne, high above, was a figure whose appearance resembled a man. From what appeared to be the waist up, he looked like a gleaming amber flickering like fire. From his waist down, he looked like a burning flame shining with splendor. All around him was a glowing halo like a rainbow shining in the clouds on a rainy day. Uh, this is what the glory of the Lord looked like to me when I saw it. I fell face down on the ground. You might remember in Exodus chapter 24 when God was confirming his covenant with the people of Israel and Moses describes the, 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 the glory of God um, uh, and, and he describes it in brilliant gemstones. Uh, it says, Then Moses, uh, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel climbed up the mountain. There they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet there seemed to be a surface of brilliant blue lapis lazuli as clear as the sky itself. <sighs> what is <laughs> it? Instead of describing a specific picture, 
Like John would come back and say, I could draw exactly what God. No, 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 you don't, no, that's not God. You can't draw a picture of God and say, this is what God looks like. No, I saw him. This is it. Here, this is what it looks like. You can't do that because it is brilliant. It is beyond our understanding. The finite mind cannot grab a hold of it. Our eyes can't, even though John was caught up in the spirit, into a dimension that one day we will get to. What he saw, he could not write down. He could not describe. The other reason is God will not define himself to an image because the minute he does, you and I know we begin to worship it. And they'd be selling it in the marketplace, and we'd be bowing down to an idol, not to the Lord our God. And he will have no idols. He will not have an idol. That's why there is no descriptor. This is God. This is what he looks like. God has none of that. Because you can't define him like that. John sees the brilliance of glistening light. He he sees colors white, uh, which which, uh, jasper may mean uh, like diamond Crystal clear and red, which is interesting. Carnelian, a ruby color. White, pure, red. I don't know, the blood of Jesus? I don't know. I'm not trying to draw that line because it doesn't draw it in Scripture. That, that's what he saw. And it had to be absolutely incredible. The throne was surrounded, he goes on, by a green-hued rainbow in appearance like an emerald. You remember the rainbow from Noah after God destroyed the earth except for Noah and his family and, and, and two of each of the animals and birds for sacrifice and all that, 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 that he, he, he paints a rainbow in the sky and it's a covenant promise. God says, I will never destroy the earth by water again. And God will be true to his covenant because he always is. And if God isn't true to his covenant promise, then he's not God because he just told a lie and he's not true, which Jesus is true. And so he sees a rainbow around this setting of the throne of God. And it's a reminder that God is a God who keeps his promises. And it's a reminder that God will restrain his wrath. What a picture to see. Habakkuk 3, 2 speaks about wrath and mercy. In thy wrath, Lord, remember mercy. Spurgeon put it this way, O child of God, the, the heavenly Father in his sovereign has a right to do with you, his child, as he pleases, but he will never let that sovereignty get out of the limit of his covenant. As a sovereign, he might cast you away, but he has promised he never will, and never will he. As a sovereign, he might leave you to perish, but he has said, I will not leave thee nor forsake thee. As a sovereign, he might suffer you to be tempted beyond your strength, but he has promised that no temptation shall happen to you, but such is common to man. And he will, um, he will be with uh, the temptation, and he will with the temptation make a way of escape. Noah saw a rainbow, symbolic of covenant. John sees a rainbow, and I don't believe it was an arc. I believe it was a circle, a complete rainbow. Of all the things, like, like in the magnificence of God, it, it, just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow your mind with this, John. You can't, you can't handle it, but do the best you can. You got the Greek language. It's pretty expressive, but you're not going to get everything, John. But I'm going to put my spirit's going to lead you and guide you. And you're going to see this brilliant rainbow. You would agree with me that the rainbow has sort of been ripped off by, by various people. And I want to I say that, that, that even though that the rainbow was never meant to be a symbol for the licensing and the validation of sinful pleasures. We need to pray that our LGBTQ friends would see the truth of the rainbow, and that is that God will keep his promises to whosoever believeth in him. They will not perish and have everlasting life. And we need to pray that they would see the rainbow not as something that legitimizes their lifestyle, but something that is meant to draw them near to God in covenant promise and that God will restrain his wrath on those who choose not to live his way. May the rainbow have a renewal of its true purpose 
That is the love of God and the covenant promises of God. And we need to be praying that. You don't want to be on the wrong side of that rainbow. Verse 4 back in Revelation says, Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. (laughs) 24 lesser thrones. 24 elders, more than likely representing the church in all the ages, these 24 elders. Unlikely that they're angelic beings. We'll speak about those in a minute, but the fact um, that they're sitting on thrones mean that they are reigning in some way with Christ, and the church has repeatedly said that it will, of the church that we will rule and reign with Christ. Revelation 2, 26 and 27 Revelation 5.10, Revelation 20, verse 4. The Greek word used there for elders is never used to refer to angels or created beings, um, but particularly to the aged ones, the elders in the church that would be called out by God to help run the church. The angels, though sometimes they appear um, in white, White garments usually find themselves symbolizing the righteousness of Christ amongst his people. And the words translated crown refers to the victor's crown won by those who have successfully competed and won the victory. By the way, did you happen to see the t-shirt that the coach for the Boston Celtics was wearing after they had won the championship? Think about this. Sorry if I digress. I'm not meaning to go from heaven to earthly things that quickly. That's like a quick drop you're thinking. Listen, um, think about if you win the championship, you're going to wear a T-shirt. You pick it. You wear whatever one you want. The shirt that he wore said, first of all, let me thank God. That was his shirt. I don't know. Anyway, I digress. Verse 5 says this, from the throne came flashes of lightning (laughs) and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. (laughs) Have you been near lightning? Like in our city, typically, we see lightning and we go 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004. Years ago, uh, Pastor Colby, our old youth pastor, you know, we we wanted to go hiking. And, you know, it does no good to look at the weather report when it comes to the mountains because it changes in a nanosecond. So we go up there, it's clear skies, and then the clouds roll in. And then then there's, there's, there's thunder and lightning. And it feels like it's like right next to us. And I, I have never in my life been a little bit frightened when I heard, like, you hear that, you, you see it, it's like, boom, and it's like, it just shakes everything within you. And, like, if you don't believe in God, you know what, man, you just get around some lightning, man, you'll be running to Jesus. <laughs> oh, Lord, <laughs> help me, God. Ooh, I mean, I just remember the feeling. And I'm like, yo, man, let's get out of here. And because he's a youngster, he's probably in his 40s, because he's a youngster, he's like, no, man, let's hang out. I'm gone, man. You want to walk home, that's on you, all right? I'm out of here, man. That's crazy. It's like, I don't know where it was, but it was, and it had this, this, this depth. And like, I wanted to just cover my ears. I was frightened. Do you hear me frightened? Like you guys are laughing at me. I know. Yeah. Well, let's see how you react when thunder and lightning are all around you. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I'll never forget it. And look at this. Here's John's description of, of power and awe and might. And it's, and it's, and it's noisy in heaven. It's like, man, it's not like, ooh, you know, peaceful stream, flowing waters, little sheep over there, Moses hanging out over there, you know, chasing a butterfly. It's boom, crap, thunder. Uh, okay, I'm trying. I, I, don't, I feel like I'm back in youth ministry again. You have to excuse me. Every once in a while I have a flashback, you know. I am speaking with adults. But anyway, can you imagine? I mean, it's like, 
uh, woo, I mean, like, I, I don't know. It, it, it's not quiet in heaven. It's not. And sometimes I think it's just, just an opinion, please. Sometimes I think we come to church and I think we have to be quiet and reverent and shh, quiet, don't say that. And I'm like, that is not how it is in heaven. You know, I mean, I just think, you know, I'm not trying to tell you how to worship God because we must worship in spirit and truth. But I think we should not be crazier at a Raiders game than we should be at church. I think every once in a while, it's okay to make some noise. Now, don't draw attention to yourself and, like, have all eyes on me. Watch this. Okay, no. But I just think we, I, why would I get all fired up in a game? And I don't realize sports is entertainment. That's all it is. Sorry, if you got a Razor, Raiders jersey on, it's all entertainment. It's, it's meant to just waste hours and hours of our life. But it's fun, and I just think we get sometimes fired up about stuff like that, and we come to church, we're like, hmm, 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 looking at the score with our phone, hallelujah, what? Oh, look at him, must have caught the Holy Ghost. No, he just saw the score. Uh, Back to the word. It reminds us of God's thunderous presence on Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, 16, on the morning of the third day, there, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. It communicates a sense of awe. That's why the Bible says it's a, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. Like you don't want to be in that, at that white throne judgment when you see him in all of his majesty and splendor and thunder and lightning and the books are open and your name's not in it. You don't want to be on that end of it. You don't. It's easy to say sitting in the comfortable 70 degree temperature here in Las Vegas, Nevada, but that day will come for all of us when we breathe our last breath and may your assurance be that you have Jesus Christ in your heart and you get to skip all that. The seven torches of fire are the seven spirits of God. Seven represents completion in the scriptures. Um, there are, like a diamond has facets and virtues and gradients that you see depending on how you look at it. Like the Holy Spirit at times came down on, out as a dove. At, at times it came down as, like a tongues of fire and and here the essence of the holy spirit is 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 multifaceted not schizophrenic like there's seven natures to the spirit well well this is speaking this is what he sees and it speaks of completeness um it it, it speaks of um like in revelation 1 4 it says grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come from the seven spirits who are before his throne. That, that's, that's that. Um, he sees a sea of, of glass like crystal. How do you describe the indescribable? What did it look like, John? It, it was like a sea of glass, but like crystal. And at that point, any further questions won't matter because that's all we know. That, that's what he says. And our confidence is as limited as even the Greek language is, is that the Spirit of God was, was downloading information as John was writing this. And he gives us the understanding to what we need to know about what he was writing, that same Holy Spirit. Verse 6 says, And around the throne, on each side of the throne, were four living creatures <laughs> full of eyes. In front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, ho holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Uh, don't ask me to, to give you a whole lot on these he heavenly bodies, these, these probably cherubim angels. 
I mean, I mean, like, 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 there's no way John just dreamed this up. Hey, yeah, let's say they had eyes all around them. No, this is this is what he saw. This is the revelation from God, and and there are these beings surrounding uh, the throne. Um, Ezekiel chapter one, verse twelve through twenty suggests that they are in constant motion around the throne. Satan, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14, was one of these high angelic beings next to the throne of God until he rebelled against God. That tells you how far he came, that he was literally in the throne room leading the worship procession, certainly a part of it, and he, he rebels in his heart. And says no. And it also goes to show you that no matter how close you get to God, you got to be careful. Because once you start to think, I got this thing, I got it down, I got it all figured out. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. We got to stay close. That's the most important thing is our hearts humble before God. Clark puts it this way regarding these angelic beings. He says, perhaps it is safest to say that the four faces are important because they represent all of animate creation in its utmost excellent. The lion is the mightiest of wild animals, the ox strongest of domesticated animals, the, ki the king eagle of all birds, and man is highest of all creation. In Shemoth Rabbah, Rabbi Abin says this, there are four which have principality in this world among intellectual creatures, man, among birds, the eagle, among cattle, the ox, and among wild beasts, the lion. Each of these has a kingdom and a certain magnificence, and they are placed under the throne of glory. I can't tell you why that is the case. If you ask 10 different theologians, you'll get 25 different answers on what those faces represent. I believe that's what John saw, and... There's no explanation given beyond that. By the way, I think we need to be careful when people have experiences, near-death experience, or whatever you might want to call it, and they come back and build a doctrine based on what they saw. I think that when it comes to what, and, and I'm, not dis I'm not doubting that someone, that those things happen because there's a lot of similarities in their stories, but let's not build a doctrine on an experience, but build it on the word of God. And what God says about heaven is rock solid. Beyond that, eh, it's fun reading, but let's not get carried away and say, oh yeah, man, there's a stream in heaven and it's got, you know, sheep and dogs and cats. Oh, wait, time out. Cats in heaven. Now we know you didn't see the truth. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> best veterinarian in the city, right there. The best, the best in the city. Raise your hand, girl. Right there, yeah. Yeah, best in the city. Cat specialist, right? Yeah, sorry. Online, how you doing? Stay with me, we're almost done. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> sea of glass. Yep. The living creatures. Yep. Ah, here we go. Verse 8. Here we go. <coughs> and day and night, they never cease to say. Okay, so these cherubim, what, like, so like, what do you do, bro? I mean, you're in heaven 24-7, right? They might say, what's that? There's no time in heaven. Okay, sorry, sorry. So what do you do? Like, what do you do? Oh, that's easy. That's easy. We do one thing. That's it? Just one thing? Yep, sounds boring. Ah, you're thinking earthly again. <laughs> Remember, we live in a dimension a gazillion times higher than you do. Oh, okay. Here's what they say. And day and night, they never cease to say, can we say this together? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, say it loud, is, is to come. Woo. 
Verse 9, and whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who was seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by you will, uh, will, uh, will they exist. By your will, they existed uh, and were created. They exist to worship God. That's what they do. And that's the song of heaven. The resounding song of heaven is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. He's outside of time. He lives in infinity. That's what they do. One uh, a Hebrew scholar said, in Hebrew, the double repetition of a word adds emphasis while the rare threefold repetition designates the superlative and calls attention to the infinite holiness of God. Like he's not love, 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 although he is that. God's not grace, 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 although he is that. But he is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. That's the song of heaven. The worship of the 24 elders is prompted by the cherubim. Since the cherubim worship God day and night, so do the elders. It's the resounding song of heaven. The idea is, as they throw their crowns down, is that the God of all glory and all power and all honor is worthy of whatever crown we might have. Clark says this, there is also an allusion to the practice in the Roman Empire. The emperor of Rome, of Rome ruled over many lesser kings, and these kings were at times commanded to come before the emperor and lay down their crowns before him in homage. Then he would give them back as a demonstration that their, that their crowns, their right to rule, their victory came from him. This is an allusion to the custom of prostrations in the East and to the homage of petty kings acknowledging the supremacy of the emperor. So when John wrote this, they would go, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, it makes sense. They cast their crowns before him. And perhaps we do too. We don't know that for sure because God has crowns for his people. Revelation 4.10, these crowns are the Stephanos crowns. These are the ones that are worn after an athletic competition for services, for winning the race. The, those, those crowns are deposited back at his feet. The 24 elders representing the redeemed of God uh, don't seem worthy, feel worthy to even have these crowns. And so they've been rewarded these crowns and they're casting them at the feet of Jesus. See, there's only one star in the kingdom. Uh, you know, a lot of times we talk about what we do for God. I did, I did this for God. I did that for God. I did the other for God. And sometimes when they hear that, I just go, sheesh, I thought God was doing all this stuff, right? Oh, yes, well, you know, I led three people to Christ. Uh, with all due respect, sir, you led no one to Christ, all right? That's what God does. It's amazing what God can accomplish all by himself, and it's amazing what God will do through people when no one cares who gets the credit. Uh, we've been praying for years for an outreach to happen at the NBA Summer League, which if you're not familiar with it, there are tens of thousands of NBA players, coaches, referees, trainers, uh, team chaplains who come into Las Vegas for about a week and a half. And they're coming, and finally we have a citywide outreach at Chaparral High School, July the 11th. I'll get you the details because we need volunteers. Alan Houston, the Phoenix Gorilla. Google it. <laughs> Other NBA players and chaplains all coming. Convoy of Hope is giving away 300 pairs of tennis shoes. They're going to give away thousands of meals, and it's going to be gospel-centered. Uh, chaplains from the NBA will be there. Uh, people who love God will be there. Current players, former players, a community outreach. And guess what? There's 30 different churches involved, and nobody cares who gets the credit. Spontaneous golf clap. It's all right. It's, it's, it's awesome. I'm so excited about it. 
by God's grace, I'll get the parking lot ministry. Yes, yes, the parking lot ministry. Ooh. Anyway, um, Jesus promised rewards to his faithful. Crown of life, James 1, 12. Crown of glory, 1 Peter 5, 4. Other crowns, rewards for faith, rewards for suffering, rewards for sharing your faith, rewards for sacrifice. The old song says it'll be worth it all someday. It'll be worth it all. It will be. And you'll take those crowns if we follow the 24 elders and you'll lay them at his feet. <laughs> because he alone is worthy. Before, um, Joseph, come on up, brother. I want to wrap up this morning. There's so much here. I feel like, I really feel like we could do Sunday service and then do Sunday night service to recap what we didn't get to at, for, at Sunday morning service. There's that much. So thank you for your... your um, uh, your heart to receive the word of the Lord. Because here's where the, why this matters. A couple of reasons. Um, if you know the name Paul Bertaccini, some of you who have been here for a while might know Paul. Paul went to go be with Jesus and um, uh, died from leukemia. And I got a chance to meet with him before he um, passed away. His family is very dear to me. His kids started coming to our youth group. And they made it a point not only to win their high school at Western High School, but also to win their whole family. Um, anyway, um, he, um, he was so, he had been meditating on heaven. And he was struggling at first, leaving everyone behind, going to heaven. And he started studying and reading up on heaven. And he was so excited. He was so excited to know where he was going. And to know that he was stepping into this place where... John described it. Um, it, it, it was, it was kind of cool to see that. See, this is when things like that matter, right? This is when that makes a big difference to know that the, de the death isn't the end. Um, to, so before we get to the wrath of God, it's important to see what's going on in heaven because all hell is going to break loose on earth in chapter 6. There's a throne in heaven and there's one seated on the throne, God Almighty. We're going to talk about Jesus next week, Lord willing. And it's not calm. It's noisy. And it's not noisy. It's calm. There's a sea of glass. It looks like a sea that looks like crystal. Uh, to me, that... That speaks of it's loud as can be, but it's a harmonic and it's beautiful and it's peaceful. I, it's it's the, being in the presence of God is it's orderly. It's not like there's a heavenly trumpet that's gone off the rails, you know, doing a solo. <laughs> it's orderly. And that's how our worship should be too, without quenching the spirit. It should be orderly. Um, and so it's calm and here's the one thing. Can you imagine? Here's the one thing that I kind of look forward to in heaven, among other things like Jesus. <laughs> worship. Worship. Whew. Is that the only song of heaven? I don't know. Sounds a little boring. The same song throughout eternity. Okay, you're thinking earthly minded. Maybe there's new revelations of God's grace and God's glory that constantly will be revealed to us throughout all of eternity and we'll just keep singing that song because that's the only reasonable song. I don't know. That tells me this also. It tells me that God has everything in control when my life is spinning out of control. That tells me that God has everything in control when everything in my life is spinning out of control. And um, 
I guess I'll leave with this, and that is that in the end, nothing else matters. <laughs> nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. All the striving, all the fighting, all the trying, all the failing, all the getting up again, all the, oh, God, we're trying. You have lifetimes like that? Y'all don't. First service had a whole, uh, everybody's hand was up. Somebody was running back and forth. Somebody walked out the back door. I'm like, where are they going? Anyway, uh, crazy. But we get all worked up over stuff, don't we? Don't we? Man, I get worked up. Woo! I get worked up. I get worked up so much my kids refuse to watch any basketball game with me. I'm like, what's your problem? Go. I want to review this one more time. Stop it. I get worked up over stuff. I get fired up. I get all, I, I, I was, I put, can I, just real briefly, I was, I was riding my bike the other day, and I was thinking about, I was thinking about something, and it, it, it was, it was, it was just some situation and some people, and I was like, and my mind started, you know, this doesn't happen to you guys. I started thinking, well, I should have said this, or I should have done that, and I, that, 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 and I'm riding my bike, which is my happy place, right, happy thoughts, you know, wind, no wind, don't matter. I'm outside, I'm riding. It's a zillion degrees, but I'm riding. I'm going downhill. What could be harder? And I get a flat tire. And you know why I got a flat tire? I feel like the Holy Spirit was like, man, don't be thinking like that. I'm just saying, that doesn't happen to anyone but me. I'm like, man, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. I know, I know. That's why he says, you know what? Lift up your eyes to the hill your help comes from. That's why, that's why he says, he said, fix your eyes on things above, not on things of the earth. That's why Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasure. You know what I think? Sanctification, sanctification is the process of me looking more towards God in heaven than, than things on the earth. It's not that I don't see things on the earth, but it's just I'm heavenly minded. And I got my eyes looking up to the hills, to the heavens, to the throne room of God. I think that's part of it. I pray that today you would be encouraged by the word and that if you're not a follower of Jesus, please, I, I beg you. And, and no more than the Holy Spirit wants you to draw you to Jesus. Like, don't play games because you do not want to be standing before that God. It's a fearful thing to, to be, stand before an angry God. And there's a time when his anger will be on full display. And I just encourage you with that to follow Jesus with all your heart and tell other people the good news. Thank you, brother. His mercy is enough. His grace is sufficient. So come and be needing forgiveness or healing. His mercy is enough. And this is our home. The cross is as
lifted our voices. What a father, what a friend, what a savior he is. Let's continue our worship throughout the week. Be blessed. Good weekend.